Where did Trinity come from? Most people I meet are friendly and have amazing stories to tell, so every time I meet them, their stories are amazing. I enjoy teaching Sumerian, and I enjoy translating the texts. We're solving a statue of Gadare in the Louvre, and it's enjoyable to translate. Sorry, he was a king of Mesopotamia, but he left all of these statues, depicting himself with building inscriptions and some long texts about him building temples. The doctrine of the Trinity is the belief that there are three persons in the Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. These three persons are equally God, but they are also different from each other and one God. The Trinity is a mystery meant to be understood, and the Bible does not explicitly teach that there are three gods. However, the passage in the New Testament that has traditionally been used to argue that the Bible supports the Trinity is found in 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. Scholars believe that the Johannine comma in 1 John, which is used to describe the doctrine of the Trinity, was added much later by a scribe and is not found in the original Greek manuscripts. The Trinity is a theological concept that is based on the Bible. It is not explicitly stated in the Bible, but it is a theological question that was answered by the idea of the Trinity. Even though the doctrine of the Trinity is not found in the Bible, it emerges from certain biblical statements that the doctrine of the Trinity must explain. The idea of the oneness of God is central to the Bible, but also, in the New Testament, you have references to Jesus being God, and then Jesus equates the Spirit to himself as an equal kind of being. So how do you explain this? Some people saw it as a problem in the early church, but most don't even think much about it today. There are various ways to solve the problem, including saying that Jesus and the Spirit aren't God. By the second century, most Christians were saying Christ is God, and the Spirit ended up getting added on because of some aspects within Christianity and in the Bible, but the issue is how can Christ be God and God be God? If there's one God and there were several solutions to that issue. So that's a kind of subordinationism, that Christ is subordinate to God but not equal to Him. There are several different solutions to the question of who created the universe that was thought of at the end of the second century that were held widely by many people, including early popes. I tend to use module modalism to describe God's existence in three modes of existence. The idea that God is three people is hugely popular, but theologians demolished it at the end of the second and into the third century, at least in the eyes of people who didn't hold to it. Theologians like Tertullian made fun of those who believed in three modes of existence, saying that they were saying that the Father got crucified, that the Father died, and that God cannot be killed. This view lost popularity, and people started saying there must be three different gods. The Christians insisted on only one God, that the Godhead was one, and that the three distinct persons who were God had the same essence. The first person to use the term Trinity was Tertullian but he didn't have the doctrine of the Trinity. Tertullian had a lot of enemies and proponents, but we don't have their writings, so we don't know how people responded to his idea. We don't have any readers' reports on the writings of the early church theologians. We don't know how they were received then, eventually, for several historical reasons and many historical contingencies, one view ended up winning out, called orthodoxy. The orthodox view of Christ's divinity was developed later than people who held that view claimed earlier predecessors, and tutorial would have been one of them. In some ways, the big moment goes back to what we dealt with in our last episode, the Emperor Constantine's conversion to Christianity. His bishop asked Arius Bishop Lane about the relationship between the Father and the Son. Arian argued that God the Father was a creative being who came into existence at some point and was separated from the Son by an infinite infinity of power and glory. The Son was a subordinate divinity who created the world and died for the sins of the world. The Bishop Bishop Alexandria thought Christ could not be seen as a subordinate divine being and argued that Jesus was an eternal being like God the Father and was equal to God the Father in every way. This led to considerable debate throughout the Christian world. Constantine realized that the church was split over this theological issue, but he didn't think of it as much of a problem and didn't see the point of settling it. Constantine called the Council of Nicaea in 325 to debate the father and son relationship. 
Over 300 bishops worldwide came to the city of Nicaea and discussed these issues with both sides and alternate views represented. The Council of Nicaea did not decide which books would be in the New Testament, but rather the relationship between the Father and the Son. The second thing is that it's not true that this is when people decided that Jesus would be God or the Son of God because everybody knew he was the Son of God. After the Council of Nasir, when Constantine twisted his arms and everyone had made a vote, one of Constantine's sons became the emperor, and he agreed with Arius. Then, all these churches started becoming Arian again, and so later, Jerome said that the world had woken up and found itself Arian. So there's back and forth until finally, toward the end of the 4th century, another council called, and they definitively ruled that the two are equal. Eventually, people started wondering about the Spirit, so they ended up with the doctrine of the Trinity. Bart Ehrman is holding a conference for anyone interested in biblical studies. The meeting will be called New Insights into the New Testament, a biblical discussion for non-scholars, and will be held over two days on September 23rd and 24th. This conference will be a two-day virtual event for people interested in biblical scholarship, but not themselves scholars. The conference will include 10 lectures by a different established expert in the New Testament, each with an A. The theme will be the New Testament Gospels. Mark Goodacker, Chair of the Department of Religion at Duke University, and Candida Moss, a regular columnist for the Daily Beast, will give expert lectures. Scholars challenging some of the orthodoxies of New Testament scholarship on the Gospels will be speaking, including Hugo Mendez at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, Robin Faith Walsh at the University of Miami, and James Tabor from the Washington Post. Jennifer Nest, a professor at Duke University, and Jody Magnus, a distinguished professor at UNC Chapel Hill, will be speaking at a conference on the manuscript tradition of the New Testament. This remote conference will cost only 59.95. If you sign up by August 26, the cost is just 49.95. You'll have no travel costs, hotels, or personal expenses, just a series of lectures by true experts over two days. We are back at New Insights into the New Testament conference time, and today, we will be talking about James Table and Jody Magnus. James Table discusses moving the goal postmark sign of the end as a failed prophecy. James Tabor is a well-known figure in the Bible and New Testament studies and has written important works on Paul, Jesus, and the Gospels. He's also a controversial figure involved with the Branch Davidian thing at Waco. Mark's Gospel is responding to the fact that Jesus' words didn't come true by recording his words and predicting the kingdom of God's arrival, but it hadn't yet. How does Mark deal with that? The podcast will be excellent and Jody Magnus will explore Jerusalem's sacred sites. Jody Magnus is a fantastic person. She's the best-known archaeologist of Israel from the time of Jesus. She's written three award-winning books, and she's going to talk about some of the natural sites, the fascinating and essential sites in Jerusalem. It's nice to see an archaeological component to biblical studies because the texts were written in and about real places, and it's essential to understand the sites that people are working with. Bard answers real questions submitted by misquoting Jesus fans about the Catholic Mass in early Christianity. What form did it take, and do we know when and why Christians started to perform this ritual? The Christian Mass refers to celebrating the Last Supper, or Lord's Supper, as it developed later in Christianity. The Bible doesn't have any theology about this event per se, but it is discussed in several places. The debate over the significance of the meal for early Christian authors has long been carried out between Protestants and Catholics, especially where Protestants would say that these elements commemorate Jesus' death and pro and Catholics say no, they become Jesus' death. People from different communities wrote the Gospels, and we don't know where they were geographically based. Scholars have speculated about where they were, but we don't know. I think they were all outside of Israel speaking Greek and it happened in an urban setting, but we don't know where. Which Bible scholars, living or dead, would you invite to a dinner party? Scholars use patterns in New Testament copying to predict how copyists would have likely altered other ancient texts with a sparse manuscript record. You can detect scribal habits in the New Testament texts because you can see what kinds of mistakes are repeatedly made and figure out why they were made. 
but the study of manuscripts has been done in every field. Classicists deal with this kind of issue all the time, and evangelical scholars sometimes say that they'd have to say the same thing about Homer, Plato, and Euripides if they said the same something about the New Testament. Traditions, especially accidental mistakes, were made, but the New Testament copyists altered the books because of their religious beliefs. This affects the other kinds of textual criticism that gets done, but not the New Testament stuff. Some Christians today don't subscribe to the doctrine of the Trinity, but the traditional doctrine is very interesting to see how it progresses. It doesn't come to complete form until centuries after the New Testament, and it's a mystery that doesn't make logical sense. Bob, thank you so much for your time and expertise. You can use the code NJ podcast for a discount on all of Bart's courses. Misquoting Jesus will return next week with a new episode on how Christianity took over the Roman Empire. It started with a tiny group of people who believed Jesus got raised from the dead, and by the end of the 4th century, there were 30 million believers.